Welcome back everyone. Today we're talking about lexical analysis and in particular why it's interesting to have a separate lexical analysis step in addition to parsing. So why lexing? Well, here's a small grammar, but it's missing something according to me. So think about the sentences that are accepted by this uh, or that are defined by this grammar and think about how you would type them into a computer. Are you not missing something? What I'm thinking about is white space. So this is a sentence defined by the language and this is not accepted because it has white space. Now, if you need to rewrite the grammar so that you accept white space, it becomes quite a mess. Okay, you need to, after each operator, insert this white space rule and a repetition of it. And white space I've defined it to be spaces, new lines, and tabs, also after numbers. This is a bit ugly. In practice, what you will tend to do is that you will redefine the operators as a rule, which has the operator and then the white space repetition. I only did it for plus, but the principle is the same for the rest. And so that gives you a separation of the grammar in two parts, the lexical parts and the syntactic part. So we can already see just from the white space why this distinction exists. So something I mentioned in the previous video is that for CFG, you want separate lexing anyway, because there are things that CFG is not able to express. And the best example of that is reserved words. So basically, in most languages, if is not allowed as an identifier, you cannot have a variable named if. Another reason why you might want separate lexical analysis is performance, and this is also true for PEG. It might seem silly, but you have to do work for every single character, and in your source file, there's a whole lot of characters. There might be like 20 times uh, less tokens than characters, because your variable names might have a number of characters, but also there's a lot of white space that has to be removed. So even though, so even though you have fewer tokens. You also have uh, all the stuff here, which is basically all the, the nodes, right? So the tokens are grouped in expressions, which are grouped in statements, declaration, blah, blah, blah. But in the end, if you have 20 times more characters, that's going to be more than all of this. So you might say, sure, but matching characters should be pretty easy, right? You just compare the character. That's true. But what's also true is that often when you do an operation that has some fixed cost. And we saw this when we implemented the parser combinator approach, right? To match a single character, we had to call a parser combinator, and that's a function call, which is already expensive, but it's a megamorphic function call, which means it's hard to inline, making it even more expensive. So this is what I just said. So typically the lexical syntax is simple enough that you could write a lexer by hand. So to give you an example, I have a Java grammar that I've written in Atom. I have a version that has everything written in PEG and I have a, a version that is hybrid. So it has a, a separate lexer and then the rest is written in PEG. And the whole PEG grammar, including the lexical layer, is about, it's less than 1,000 lines, maybe 900. And the lexer is the same size. So it's simple, but at the same time, it's still a lot of code. The way it's typically implemented is as a loop, because that optimizes very well, with a switch statement. And the switch statement, look at the first character and then routes you to code that handles uh, the kinds of things that start with that character. So typically, you'll uh, try to emit operators directly within the switch because they only have a few characters. And if you see that uh, it starts with letters, you will try to match keywords. Otherwise, you will parse the whole identifier. The other way that you can do lexing is to generate this lexer. And typically, you're going to generate a lexer that works also like this with a loop and switches. And to generate it from a simple model, so 99% of the time, that is regular expressions. And we're going to talk more about that in the next video. 
um, I want to give you a small quote that is very interesting. Lexing has always been the succubus leeching the cycles out of a compiler. By Walter Bright, creator of the D language. Now what's interesting here is that the D compiler is very heavily optimized. The Lexer is very heavily optimized. And even after all of this, Lexing is what takes the most time in the compiler. Not only in the front end, so not only in the parsing, but in the whole compiler. So that really shows that little things do add up. So say you want to match with regular expressions. The idea is that you have one regular expression for a token that you're trying to match, and you make one big regular expression out of these expressions. And you attempt to match that at the start of what's left of it, of the input. Whichever regular expression matches the most characters, that's the regular expression for the token that you will emit. So there are multiple flavors of regular expressions. There's a standard flavor, which is whatever maps to regular grammars, and that can be matched in linear time. Programming languages also tend to come with regular expression libraries, and typically those have a bit more features. And one that's particularly popular is PCRE, the Perl compatible regular expressions. Those should most of the time also parse linearly, but they do have some more features that make them potentially exponential. And interestingly, it makes them sometimes exponential, even when you're not use, using these features. An example of such feature would be back references, where you capture something that you matched, and then later you attempt to match it again. And what that does basically that is that it prevents you from building the automaton, the deterministic finite automaton, which uh, lets you parse regexes in linear time. So here is an, an interesting figure. So what's going on here is that we're trying to match this regex. But this is uh, optional A, repeated n times. So it, it's just the same as writing it n times. So it's like A interrogation mark, A interrogation mark, etc. Followed by A n times on an input that is A n times. And n is going to be fixed. So we're going to decide in advance what n is. The guy that made this figure is running the experiment with uh, different n's. That was, that's what these x's here are. What you can see is that as n increases, the runtime, if you use PCRE, uh, increases exponentially. Whereas if you use this approach, which is a different way to implement uh, the automaton, and we'll talk about this in the next video, uh, then it only increases linearly. And you'll notice that the time scale is not the same. This is microseconds and this is seconds. So this is actually uh, not worse here. It's just a different scale, so it's always better. Now, you should use your critical thinking because I told you most of the time this is linear, but it can theoretically be exponential. This is the same as parsing expression grammars, right? And for parsing expression grammars, I told you, you shouldn't worry about it except for binary expressions. So what about PCRE? Is this realistic? And I'll be honest, I'm not sure. I don't know. So I tried Googling it, which is the least amount of effort that anyone should put into answering a question. And I came up with maybe a good example of grammar that would be both practical and would also run ex exponentially. Just be aware that it's a possibility that when using these libraries, the runtime could be exponential. So here's a question for you. If matching a regular expression takes linear time, right, n is the input size, what is the complexity of lexing? So lexing is repeatedly matching a regular expression where each expression that you match is going to be one token. So the answer is theoretically O of n squared. Because in the worst case, you have very short tokens, but you need to look at the whole input to decide that the token that you want is actually very short. 
here is a simple example to see that. So the input is going to be uh, a bunch of A's. And the regex that we have is either A. So that's uh, a token type, that's just an A. And then there's a token type that, that is a repetition of A's followed by an X. There's no X there. So we always are going to emit the A token, N times in fact. But for each of them, we need to go look to the end of the input to see if there's not an X there. So that's an example where you take O N squared. Again, this is a contrived example, and in practice, this is never an issue. What I'm trying to show you here is that it is very important to think about theoretical properties. So you should think about theoretical complexity. But at the same time, you should also think critically. Once you have the figure, you don't stop and say, oh, it's O N squared and it's bad. You think, when does this actually happen? Okay, in which cases, in which scenarios, are those likely or unlikely? Okay, next time we are going to talk about Lexinger's regular expressions, and in particular, I will show you how to build the deterministic finite automatons that make it possible to parse regular expressions in linear time. See ya, and take care.